of the Lord, and we say, thanks be to God. We have now arrived at the preaching hour, that sacred Kairos moment where we knock on the pearly gates of heaven and beckon our God to come down. Will you pray with me? In the words of Barbara Brown Taylor, Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Enlighten us with your celestial fire. For if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are with us, then nothing else matters. Be with my beloved Lincoln Church this morning, Lord, we plead and we pray. Amen. Travel back in time with me. Travel back in time with me when a society of people were suddenly confronted with a worldwide phenomenon. Travel back in time with me when out of nowhere, the people were thrust into a period of hardship they didn't know how long would last. When their life as they knew it would be no more. A time when misinformation and disinformation were rampant. When there were some folks telling the people that this period of hardship wouldn't last very long. A time when after panicking and questioning and denying, the people realized that this new normal was going to stick around for a while. The way they conducted business would have to change. The way they cared for their families would have to change. The way they lived their very lives would have to change. A time when the people finally accepted that when it came to this new reality, they couldn't go over it. They couldn't go under it. They couldn't go around it, but that they could only go through it. Now, many of you may be thinking back to March of 2020, and you may be thinking that because, well, I carefully constructed these words to suggest that. But I need for us to go back a little further. I need for us to go back to to 587 BCE. There are many prophets who could tell this story. There are several prophets who have something to say about this period. We could hear from the privileged Isaiah, from his cozy perch in the king's court. We could hear from the eccentric Ezekiel, eating scrolls and all that. He had a front row seat. But this morning, friends, we're going to hear from that old weeping prophet. This morning, we're going to hear this story through the words of Jeremiah. You see, at that time, the children of Israel were witnessing the siege of their beloved city, Jerusalem, and the destruction of their precious temple therein. They were entering Babylonian captivity and were exiled from their homeland. Now, there are many details about how this tragedy came about. You could throw some idol worship into the pot. You could throw some deceitful kings who grew tired of keeping the peace with Babylon. Throw that in the pot. The children of God participating in the customs of the enemies like child sacrifice. You could throw that in the pot. There's a lot that you can throw into the pot to make this witch's brew. 
But just know that according to Jeremiah, this new period of hardship, this new era of the unknown, this new reality was brought about by the people. Jeremiah had a hard job. He was called the weeping prophet for good reason. Through the words of Jeremiah, we learn that the Hebrew God, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, was, was so disturbed by the idol worship and the perpetuation of injustices on the most vulnerable, the widows and the orphans, that God allowed the Babylonians to rise up and persecute the people of God. This is not an easy story to tell, friends. But according to Jeremiah, God decided to use Babylon to bring judgment on God's own people. They had brazenly broken the Mosaic Covenant and were acting in a way that not only tore the tablets in two, but also tore the very heart of God in two. And so the consequence of their actions, according to Jeremiah, led to a period of exile, a time when the people were thrust into a period of hardship they didn't know how long would last, a time when misinformation and disinformation were rampant, a time when after panicking and questioning and denying, the people realized that this new normal was going to stick around for a while, the way they conducted business would have to change, the way they cared for their families would have to change, and the way they lived their very lives would have to change. A time when the people would finally accept that when it came to this new normal, they couldn't go over it. They couldn't go under it. They couldn't go around it. But that they could only go through it. For 70 years. Let's trace this story through the pages of the weeping prophet. Let, let, let's see what Jeremiah has to say. In chapter 28, we are introduced to a false prophet spreading misinformation. We meet Hananiah. And Hananiah comes along and says, yeah, we're going to be in captivity. This pandemic is happening, but it will be over in two years. So this false prophet Hananiah comes along, and in chapter 28, verses 15 through 17, we find these words. And the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. And you made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you told them to drink bleach and use a lightsaber. Wait a minute. I am so sorry I got my notes mixed up. Je Je Jeremiah says to the false prophet Hananiah, God has not sent you. You've made these people trust in a lie. And so within this year, you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. And in that same year, in the seventh month, the Bible says the prophet Hananiah died. If only it were that easy. See, wh what I'm trying to get at, church, is that when it came to this 70 year period of exile, they couldn't go over it. They couldn't go under it. They couldn't go around it. They had to go through it. Jeremiah makes this clear in chapter 29. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place after that time. 
Anybody in here realize that they just had to go through it? So, so what do you do? What do you do when you realize that you can only go through? How does your relationship with God change when you are going through? Do you draw closer to God? Or does God feel distant to you in those moments? Do we trust God to take us through? Remember, friends, Jesus was on the seas himself, and the storms still came. Lincoln, I know that we're familiar with a God of deliverance. I know that we're familiar with a God of salvation, but are we familiar with a God who can take us through? Are we familiar with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a God who can be that fourth figure following behind us in the fiery furnace? It's not that they weren't thrown into the fiery furnace. It's that when they were thrown into the furnace, God went with them. Are you familiar with Daniel, with a God who can take away the appetite of ravenous lions while he was in that den? It's not that he wasn't thrown in the den. It's that when he was thrown in the den, God went with him. Are you familiar, like Moses, with a God who... In the wilderness, surrounded by wild animals and danger all around. It's not that they didn't spend time in the wilderness. It's that God went with them. Are we familiar with this God? Are we familiar like the woman who was about to be killed by stones from that circle of men? A woman to be stoned except for the words of Jesus who said, you are, who are without sin, cast the first stone. It's not that they didn't drag her out in public. It's not that they didn't pick up heavy stones to kill her. It's not that they didn't pull their arms back to throw. It's that before those stones could leave their hands, Jesus showed up. What I'm trying to ask you, church, is yes, you're familiar with a God who can rescue. And yes, you're familiar with a God who can deliver. But are you familiar with a God who can take you through? The psalmist David is familiar with that God. In the 23rd Psalm, he writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why, church? Because thou art with me. Are there any yea, though, people in this church this morning? Where are my yea, though, people? Yea, though, the money got tight. Yea, though, the doctor had a bad report. Yea, though, the kids ain't acting right. Yea, though, our politics are broken. Yea, though, sometimes it's hard to see the road up ahead. Yea, though, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because you're with me. Because you're with me. Yes, Lincoln, we serve a God who can deliver. And yes, we serve a God who can save. But we also serve a God who can take us through. Jeremiah encourages the people to keep living while they're going through. Jeremiah says, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile <laughs> and pray on their behalf. <laughs> For it's in their welfare where you will find your welfare. Jeremiah tells them to fortify themselves, to increase, to dig deeper, to stretch your faith. Because Jeremiah, that weeping prophet, knew what it was like to go through. 
Jeremiah was beaten and, and placed in prison. Jeremiah was thrown into a, a cistern, a, a deep well, and left for dead. Jeremiah had kings and traitors putting bounties on his head. And after all of that, the people still didn't listen. God's judgment still came. That, that weeping prophet had reasons to cry. That weeping prophet earned every tear. But this weeping prophet was also familiar with a God who can take you through. Jeremiah is familiar like the psalm writer. That weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Jeremiah knew what was on the other side of through. <laughs> Jeremiah knew like many of you know, what's on the other side of through. Jeremiah knew about a deeper love on the other side of through. Jeremiah knew about a new understanding of God on the other side of through. Jeremiah knew about a new covenant on the other side of through. For in that 31st chapter of Jeremiah, we find these words that Helen helped us lift up just a minute ago. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. But this is the new covenant. Hear me, church, that I will make with the people of God. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. You don't need the stone tablets anymore, people of God, because the law and love of God will be written on your very hearts. I will put my law within them, and I will be their God. And they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. Lincoln, I, I stopped by here briefly to tell you. Don't be afraid of going through. Because on the other side of through is a new covenant. And God's law and love will no longer be written on stone tablets, but on the other side of through, the law and love of God will be etched into your very hearts. A whole generation might just have the ways of God written on their heart. You might just find the love of God no longer just in the four walls of a church, no longer in the 66 books of that Bible, but you might just find the love of God etched in your very hearts. When God brings you through, God gives you a, a heart tattoo. <laughs> when God brings you through, you get a heart tattoo, and, and, and on your heart is tattooed, love your neighbor. On your heart, God tattoos, love your enemies. On your heart, God tattoos, when I was hungry, you gave me food. On your heart, God tattoos, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. On the heart, God tattoos, when I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. On the heart, God tattoos, for the least of these. Oh, Steve, I don't have any tattoos on my physical body. I'm just not that cool to pull them off. <laughs> but church, I do have one spiritual tattoo. Because on my heart is tattooed the love of God. <laughs> That will be permanent until I draw my last breath. No physical tattoos, but one spiritual tattoo for etched in my heart is the love of God. 
What about you? What about you? Don't be afraid to go through church because that's when you get your heart tattooed. Glory be to God. Amen.